So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this webinar on, on how to ASG maths and dense correction using the meaning-based approach. My name is Rajit Sadana. I'm going to be your co-host today. Um, along with me, I have uh, Shraddha Jaiswal, who's a senior um, uh, verbal expert at DG Madden. She's going to be your main host today. In this webinar, we're going to discuss the, the meaning-based approach that EG Matt pioneered about a decade back and, and is now the industry standard when it comes to the so approaching 700-level sentence correction questions. Um, we're going to make sure that um, as you get through this webinar, you, you solve not just, um, you know, just partially underlined or fully underlined questions, but questions where the intended meaning is obvious versus questions where the intended meaning needs to be inferred based on, on, on the information that's, that's given to you. So uh, overall, uh, it's going to be a fairly intense webinar. It's going to be a fairly application-focused webinar. And to get the most out of it, you'd have to probably be on your toes throughout this webinar. Since this is a fairly application-focused webinar, one of the first things that um, you know I would want you to do if you've not done this before is go through um, the prerequisite that we sent out. So um, uh, we the prerequisites on the top right-hand corner, which is video lessons, the verb ing modifiers, and verb ed phrases, are, are are absolutely essential when it comes to getting the most out of um, a, a sentence that that conveys a sophisticated meaning. And if you've not gone through these video lessons, they're a part of your free trial, make sure you go through them post this webinar. Um, also, we've shared a few um, eBooks with you, go through them as well. If you've gone through them, that's wonderful. Uh, you know, you're, you're prepared for this webinar, you're gonna get the most out of this webinar. Uh, with that, we also have some upcoming free webinars. We have a free webinar on GMAT number properties, that is tomorrow. Um, in this webinar, we focus very specifically on uh, on remainders, and 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 again, we start from the very very basics of remainders, and and by the end of this two-hour long session, um, we equip you enough so that you're able to answer some of the most sophisticated questions when it comes to remainders. If you've not registered for this one, you can click on the register now button to register for that. And then next week we have um, a, a webinar on 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 GMAT RC um, again. A lot of people think when it comes to async GMAT RC, you need to be a voracious reader, you need to be someone who's been reading a lot of content. Um, in this webinar, we talk about a few key reading strategies. We actually bust this myth. Um, and, and we talk about you know how GMAT RC is way more about comprehension and how if you follow a few reading strategies, how you, if you read in a certain focused manner, how you can improve your comprehension and consequently improve your performance on GMAT reading comprehension. Okay, then next week, uh, we also have another webinar, which is a follow-on webinar on verb ing modifiers that I'm going to talk about towards the end of this, this session. Um, so for those of you who can of attend a majority of this webinar, you're going to get access to that bonus webinar as well. Uh, with that, I want to make sure that um, you know we get to know you guys a bit better before I pass on, um, on, on, on the controls to Shraddha. So I want to know how many of you are, are taking the test in, in the next three months or so. And then the next question that I have is, what is your uh, target GMAT score? Let's get that poll here as well. I want to kind of um, also ask, I think even though that information can partly be inferred from this, I want to also ask how many of you, just a yes, no question um, on the right, how many of you are planning to apply in, um, in, in R2? And let me see if we have a yes, no question here that I can, uh, yeah, I do have a yes, no question here on the right. Um, if you're planning to apply in R2, select yes. If you're planning to apply post R2, uh, round two, that is, then select no. Uh, all right. So with that, when do people plan to take the test? Um, you know, we, we, we have um, uh, about 36% of you have not taken a data as of yet and then another 13% to more than 45 days so we, before the test. So um, those who haven't taken a data as of yet, a majority of you likely are not planning to apply in R2. Some of you who have more than 45 days are probably also not planning to apply, but then everyone else in the, in the top three buckets um, is, is planning to apply in, in R2. Okay. Um, then in terms of your target GMAT score, you know, 730 to 760, Half of you are aiming for that. It's a wonderful score. It, it requires a lot of effort. We have a few folks who are aiming for a score better than 760, about uh, 13 of you or so. And then um, 
we have about then but the rest 36 percent who are in that 7 10 7 20 or, or or lower bracket uh, just one last question and i should have had this poll but i think since um yeah, it, it is a very pertinent question uh, given the recent changes. So, what kind of, uh, uh, how are you planning to take the GMAT? Which format essentially? I'm just making this, I'm going to make it really short. So the question really is which format are you planning to take when you take the GMAT? Is it going to be online or is it going to be in center? You know what? I'm going to actually put in one other thing just forget uh, i'm going to just clear all answers edit the poll and, and because some of you may also uh, be undecided i just want to add this one last piece and my apologies for that okay again let's get those answers once again if some of you are undecided you can choose the undecided part but for those of you plan to take it online versus in center uh, this is just to get some data points over here. All right, perfect. Um, but 57% in center, but 28% online, and then about 15% undecided. Okay, with that, I'm, I'm done with this um, introduction over here. And, um, and, and, and so I'm going to now pass on uh, the controls to Shraddha. Shraddha, over to you. We're going to go into the presentation part. And, and just before uh, Shraddha takes over, just some logistical pieces over here. Um, what you see is a presentation part and, and a Q&A part or a question and answer part. And, um, and, and and essentially, during the session, if you have any question, you can put your question in the Q&A part. That way, either um, Shraddha or, or I or we have Kanupriya, who's a senior subject matter expert as well, can answer your question. Now, just to make sure that we keep this session on track, you know, please make sure your questions are pertinent to what we're talking about. So don't talk about CR and RC. If you have questions about other subsections in verbal or GMAT quant or about your MBA applications, hold them till the end when I come back and, and you know, I usually respond to those questions. There is about 15 to 20 minutes towards the end to answer those questions or so. Okay, with that, Shraddha, I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to pass on the controls to you. Hello everyone. If you can hear me all good, could you please click on yes in the yes or no poll? All right. Answers coming in fast. All right. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, whichever time zone you are in. My name is Shraddha and um, I'm going to take you through the four official questions that we are going to solve here. And let's just begin with that. So, yep, let's just, so right now we are going to do our first question and you are going to solve this question the way you generally solve it. And I'm not going to time you and that's why the poll that you see on your screen right now, the last option reads still solving. I want all of you, those who are participating in this question with me to click on still solving so that I know that how many of you are uh, attempting this question. And because I don't have my timer on, even if the screen says that the time is 90 seconds, I'm actually not going to time you. So you are going to decide how long you're taking to solve this question. As long as 80% of the class is done answering this question, that's when we will start discussing this question. So um, we are about 178 people in this webinar. Can I see a little more participation over here? And you will see the question once I have gotten enough uh, votes. So a little more, please. Uh, I can see a couple of you have clicked on choices C and E. Please don't do so. I have still not shown you the question. So could you click on still solving? All right. All right. So with this, let's take a look at the sentence. Here is your first question. All the very best.
All right, I see most of you are done answering this question. Let's wind this one up now. Let's just take 10 seconds to wind this one up. Right, ending the poll. I still have a few people on still solving. If you guys just want to take a guess, select an answer choice, move on. Otherwise, here I end the poll. All right, okay. So let's take a look at this question and we are going to talk about what is the approach that generally students take when they solve this question. They read, they read this question, then they focus on the underlying portion of the sentence. It says, than the coming to an end of a period of rapid growth. And then they go back in the sentence and they see that, okay, we have less X than Y. That idiom has been used for comparison in the sentence less is followed by by but than is not followed by a by so the parallelism violation is there so what happens is um, we we scan through all the answer choices because we know that we need a by after than to maintain the parallelism so a and b are out right so that's the split method that we used a b without by c d e with by so a b a b uh, are out and then um, among the remaining three choices, C, by the coming to an end of, I mean, we don't talk like that, we don't write things like that, doesn't look very nice. So, uh, choice uh, C is rejected. And then the uh, choice boils down between by ending and by the end of. And, you know, if I compare the two answer choices, by the end of looks much more elegant, looks much more nice. So, um, very straightforward, this is how we talk, this is how we write, so we end up selecting choice E. And if I, if I broadcast your results over here, that's the result that I see with this group as well. 43% of the class, which is, you know, 67 of you, majority of you landed up selecting choice E. But if you selected choice E, let me tell you, your answer is incorrect. Choice E is not the correct answer for this question. Now, just for your reference, this is an official question. Official guide actually identifies this question as a grammar-based question, but actually it requires the understanding of the meaning used in this sentence, specifically the underlined portion of the sentence. So even if you tried the splits method for this question, it did not work for you. So that's your takeaway, that splits method do not work on difficult questions because the more the difficult a question is, it is actually playing more on on the logic of it, not so much on the grammar of it, because identifying grammar is an easy thing, um, but identifying logic actually requires a very good understanding of the original sentence. And that is what we are going to see uh, with this question as to how to understand the meaning. So at EGMAT, when we apply the uh, meaning-based approach, you know, how are we going to solve this question? So, of course, this question is a lengthy question. If I try to read everything in one go, it's absolutely impossible for me to understand the meaning of it. And that's why at EGMAT, the first thing we ask our students to do is to break this sentence 
into smaller chunks and that's what exactly you see on your screen and I'm going to read each and every chunk one by one after the other and then I'm going to assimilate them together to get the real story treat it like you are solving a jigsaw puzzle over here these are different pieces of your puzzle now you need to put them together to get the logical picture of this uh, sentence so the sentence says and let me just um, get my annotations in place all right so the sentence says the overall slackening of growth in productivity is influenced all right so slackening of growth something is going down and that slackening is influenced by by what less by government regulation so the moment I reach this part of the sentence I understand that the sentence is going to present a comparison that means the, the uh, sentence is going to talk about two factors that that have influenced or that are influencing the slackening of growth so the first factor over here this is my first factor is government regulation and then the sentence adds a little more information about these government regulations with a contrast word because I read although over here although that is significant for specific industries like mining all right so this part of the sentence is saying that okay government regulation can be important for some very specific industries and in, an example has been presented but the sentence says that um, the slackening of growth is less influenced by government regulation so what is it less to what is that other part of comparison now we are going to read that then the coming to an end of a period of rapid growth in agricultural productivity so now the sentence presents the second factor that is more influential on the overall slackening of growth in productivity and that factor is coming to an end of a period that means a period of rapid growth in a particular sector and in particular activity is coming to an end it's slowly winding off right so this is this is how we understand the meaning of the sentence and on your screen you see different aspects that we have derived from this sentence what are these aspects these aspects are the logical points that the sentence intends to convey and these aspects form the complete logic of this sentence all right so now that we understand the meaning of the sentence very very well now we are so right now I have not looked into grammar at all all I was trying to do is to extract these logical aspects my logical points that my sentence must contain to convey the intended meaning now once I have done that I will move on to my next step but before I do so I want you to take a poll and here I am I want you to take this poll Would you give me just one second I'm trying to all right so now you see the question on your screen already there are three options a and B and C now how did you interpret the meaning of the phrase the coming to an end of when you answered the question again my question to you is how did you interpret the meaning of the coming to an end of when you solved the question that's what I want to understand still getting some votes here let me broadcast the result in the meantime and so look at look at these answers and I'm and and it's still counting choice a most of the votes are for choice a the period is slowly coming to an end yes that's what the sentence wants to say if we were to take an example over here 
let's see what we are saying the woolly mammoth became extinct by the coming to the end of the ice age so this ice age has been put into a timeline with different periods marked as a b c and d so it's not that woolly mammoth became extinct in one go slowly 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 the ice age uh, came to an end from point a to b to c to d and in all these points we saw that the number of woolly mammoths kept decreasing by the time um, the ice age ended there were no woolly mammoths left right so that's the meaning of the coming to an end of a period a period that is ending very very i mean that is ending uh, gradually next is the action of ending the period and this is what we see in one of the answer choices where it is written by ending a period of growth of agricultural productivity right so that is what we have translated here but if we put it in our example sentence what do we get here the woolly mammoth became extinct by ending the ice age is it so that the woolly mammoth they ended the ice age and that's why they became extinct or that's how they became extinct definitely this meaning is absolutely not logical choice c the end of the period this is this is this is the phrase that we see in one of the answer choices as well and in one of the most popular answer choices which is choice e right so what does this uh, phrase uh, mean uh, in in the context of this sentence the woolly mammoth became extinct by the end of the ice age that means a they, there were so many woolly mammoths the same number of woolly mammoths in time b in time c but in time d they just vanished completely so we are only talking about point d over here there is no sense of that gradual winding up of this time period that information is not covered in the expression the end of the period all right so now that we understand this part of the sentence and we understand the meaning of our original sentence as well i'm going to ask you to take this poll one more time okay and just give me one second i'm going to show you the question again sorry about that i should have put that question there all right let's go back here i want you to attempt the question one more time and this time make a selection on the understanding i'm not sure what happened here right so now solve this question with the understanding of the meaning of this phrase the coming to an end of period if you were given another chance to attempt this question after understanding the intended meaning of the sentence then which answer choice would you pick all right so if i broadcast my result over here look at that change from first poll to the second poll look at the number of votes choice c has gotten now and it's still increasing it's still increasing it's a clean sweep almost 90% of the class and now it's 90% of the class that would go with choice c because now you understand the meaning of this phrase the coming to an end of all right and so now if we take a look at the answer choices because now we have understood the meaning of the sentence very well we understand what the coming to an end of means now we will take a look at the sentence to find out the grammatical error okay and when we scan the sentence for the grammar 
we understand that of course uh, we are using an idiom less by government regulation than it should be by the coming to an end of right it should be by so that by is missing and so of course there, there is a parallelism issue and we already spoke most of you do not choose choices a and b the results are right in front of you through the two poles that we have here and so choice b is wrong now original sentence keeps this uh, the coming to an end of it talks about that period that is slowly winding off but in choice b we have by ending and this is exactly the same example the woolly mammoth extinct by ending the ice age that's illogical in the same way we cannot say the overall slackening of growth in productivity is influenced by ending a period of rapid growth the slackening of growth is not ending anything or there is no other uh, no other person involved in ending that period and so choice b although it is grammatically correct it totally changes the intended meaning of the sentence completely makes it illogical same happens with choice e also by the end of again we saw the woolly mammoth example when we say that the woolly mammoth extinct at by the end of ice age that means there is no sense of this period of ice age slowly coming to an end it just talks about it doesn't talk about point a point b point c and point d in the timeline it only talks about point d in timeline there is no gradual decline or winding up of the period and that's why choice e is incorrect because when we say the overall slackening of growth and productivity is influenced by the end of a period uh, <clears throat> of rapid growth it means that just at the end of that period everything the slackening is influenced what happened before that whatever that winding off of the period we have no idea about that but look at choice c it indeed is the correct answer because the only issue with the original sentence was the missing by the meaning was never an issue with choice a so choice c very nicely plugs in that missing by and it stands as the correct answer and once you understand the meaning of the sentence selection was so so easy for you all of you landed up on choice c all right so i'll just take you back one slide and here this is very important take away uh if we come to think about it why do we have sentence correction as our gmat test i mean are you really going to do this when you become mbas when you start working for the firms that you that you would be working for no you would not be i mean you would not be doing proof readings of of the documents right but you would be doing case study and sc actually equips you with the with the uh, skill to to see how well you understand the in the meaning that is being conveyed through a particular sentence and that's why it is a test of meaning and logic and that's why we are the only one who talk about meaning based approach because once you understand the meaning the logic and think about it why do we communicate with people be it written or be it verbal we do it to express an idea that idea has to be logical in order to present that logic we select grammar so grammar is a tool to present a logical idea if you keep this point in mind you will understand that the first thing i need to make sure is that i must understand what the author is trying to convey through the sentence that is presented to me also keep in mind the original sentence is just not there to provide you with one of the answer choices the original text sentence tells you or shares with you the story that the author wants to tell you through this one single sentence so 
we first must pay attention to the logic that the author wants to convey. Once we ascertain that, then we can decide on the grammar like we did. We first understood what the meaning this sentence wants to convey. And we understood that, yeah, meaning is all fine here. But yes, my dear friend, author, you missed out this by when you were writing this sentence. And that's what we plug in and we choose this answer. And that's how we come about the correct answer choice. All right. So let's do a, a little takeaway here. I think I've already told you, understand the meaning of the sentence is where you begin with in sentence correction. Okay. And the more the sentences are going to get difficult, understand that they are going to play more and more on logic. All right. Now, a little overview of this question. This question is an official question from OG Advanced. So definitely, it's a 700 plus 700 level question. In fact, all the questions that you're, we are going to solve in this uh, session are going to be uh, 700 level questions. Uh, splits method, yes, we could apply splits method in this question. But did it work for us? No, it did not. See what happened. Take a look at your first attempt. When we applied the splits method, we actually landed up in the inc on the incorrect answer choice because we did not uh, stop to <clears throat> understand the meaning of the sentence. But when we did that, see, here is our result for from our uh, second uh, attempt, right? So you did need the understanding of the underlined phrase in the sentence in order to choose the correct answer choice because all the answer choices out there are grammatically correct. But despite, I mean, not A and B, of course, we can reject them by by the absence of by, but of course, C, D and E were, they are grammatically correct, but the meaning that they convey does not fit into the context of our original sentence. All right. So let me just quickly take the pulse of the class. Are you all with me on this? Did it all make sense to you? The meaning-based approach, how did we arrive at the correct answer choice? How important was it for us to understand the meaning of that small little underlined portion of the sentence? Although the sentence was long, only 25% of it was underlined, but the entire thing depended on understanding the intended meaning conveyed by that small underlined portion of the sentence. Okay? All right. So with this, now that you have been, you know, you, you saw meaning-based approach, I would want you to, all right, I'm sorry about that. This is not the poll that I want here. Okay. So try to solve the next question, uh, keeping the very same uh, approach. Okay. Uh, try to apply the meaning-based approach. Again, timing is not a constraint here, guys. Timing is not a constraint. So don't worry about it. But try to, I'm not saying that you will become absolutely proficient in using the process just by looking at one sentence. No. But at least try to look at the sentence more from the meaning, uh, uh, meaning perspective. Okay. So let's do still solving here. Can, can I get more still solving before I show you the question? <clears throat> Little more, just a few more. Let's get, I'm, I'm trying to get that number 200. <laughs> if you cooperate, we can, I just need five more people to click on still solving. There we go. Here I show you question number two and your poll is ready. All the best. Meaning based approach. Look at the meaning.
All right, most of you are done solving this question. So let's wind this up so that we can discuss this one. All right. All right. Three, two, one, zero. Okay. I guess I'm ready to close the poll. Those those of you who've not made a selection so far, let's just click on any of the answer choices and move on. All right, I'm ending the poll here. Okay. All right. So let's do the meaning-based approach. We will first try to understand the meaning. And once again, you can see how we have broken this sentence down into smaller chunks. Because if I read everything in one go, I'm not going to understand anything. Okay. At this point in time, I would also request you to keep uh, your pen and paper ready, pencil or paper ready, whatever you have. I want you to note down a few points because, you know, it's really important that you pay attention to that so that you don't end up asking the same questions later, okay? So let's do the analysis. Although the very first word that I read here is a contrast word, okay? So the sentence is going to present a contrast. That's my uh, expectation. Appearing less appetizing than most of their round and red supermarket cousins, okay? So I also have a comparison going on. There is something that is less appetizing or less delicious, who have they been compared to than most of their round and red supermarket cousins? Woo, red and round supermarket cousins. So what are we talking about here? We are talking here about heirloom tomatoes. All right. So heirloom tomatoes, they look less, uh, they are less attractive than most of their round and red, you know, sounds very nice in terms of appearance from their red supermarket cousins. Heirloom tomatoes, this part of the sentence presents more information. What are these heirloom tomatoes? They are grown from seeds that were saved the previous year. Okay, those are heirloom tomatoes. What about these heirloom tomatoes? They are often green and striped or have plenty of bumps and bruises okay so the heirloom tomatoes are often green and striped or they have plenty of uh, we can say deformities in terms of appearance so they definitely look very nice okay and that's what the first part of the sentence is talking about although appearing less appetizing so the author has now presented how heirloom tomatoes look so that we can understand that when the author says that heirloom tomatoes are less appetizing, we can actually get this point. Why the author has described them as less appetizing? Because they are often green and striped or they have lots of bumps and bruises. They are not really good looking types. But their supermarket cousins, the round and red supermarket cousins, if you compare these two qualities, the supermarket cousins have been called round and red, right? Very nice. I mean, you, we, we all have our experience with tomatoes. Just try to visualize how pretty they look. But if you were, if you were to look at just next to those red and round supermarkets, heirloom tomatoes, that are green and striped or they have lots of bumps and lot of um, bruises. I mean, they, they don't look really, really nice. Of course, you would, when you compare the physical appearance, definitely heirloom tomatoes look less attractive. And that's what the sentence has spoken to us so far. What is the last bit of the sentence that's talking? Heirloom tomatoes are more flavorful. Oh, wow. 
So even if they look less attractive, they are definitely more flavorful than their round and red supermarkets and thus here we understand the result of it. Because they are more flavorful, they are increasing in or they, uh, they are in increasing demand. So this is what the sentence is telling us. It's presenting a comparison first between the round and red supermarket cousins and the green and bumpy and striped heirloom tomatoes. Um, obviously, the heirloom tomatoes look less attractive. But again, there is a contrast. Even though they look less attractive, they are more flavorful. And that is the reason why they are in increasing demand. So this is how we understand the meaning of the sentence. Now it's time for me to ask a few questions and the answers that you provide to this question, make a note of that because then, you know, you will not ask questions that are not required. I mean, you know, if you understood the meaning so well, you shouldn't be asking those questions. So here my first question to you is, what appears less appetizing than most of their round and red supermarket cousins? Uh, take two short answer polls. So short answer polls uh, is the poll that you will use to answer my question. Q&A pod is the pod where you ask a question to us. Heirloom tomatoes, all of you, perfect answer. You can just say HT, that will save you time. Let's use abbreviations here. Perfectly fine. They look less appetizing. Okay. Next question. Let me clear the answers here. What are grown from seeds? saved during the previous year yes of course ht we know that the sentence clearly says that okay let's move on to our next question and i'm going to clear my answers over here my next question is what are green and striped or have lots of bumps and bruises of course uh, uh heirloom tomatoes because the supermarket cousins are round and red what is green and uh, bumpy or striped are the heirloom tomatoes. Make a note of all these answers that you are, I mean, all these questions and answers that you are, I mean, that we are participating in right now, okay? All right, let's move to my last question that I'm going to ask you from here is, what are more flavorful and hence in increasing demand? And of course, the answer is heirloom tomatoes all right so this entire sentence is about heirloom tomatoes but we do have some more description about the supermarket cousins that they are round and red but they look very fancy but they are less flavorful in uh, when compared to um, they are less they are less flavorful compared to heirloom tomatoes and because heirloom tomatoes are so flavorful they are in increasing demand okay so we understand the meaning of the sentence absolutely well here so these are the few aspects that we took out while we answered those four questions now you see here points a1 through a4 my question to you is which two points present the contrast? Which two points that you see from A1 through A4 on your screen, which two points present the contrast that is presented by the use of although? All right, so here I've gotten answers. Most of you are saying it's one and four, and that is absolutely correct. The word although presents the contrast between the appearance of heirloom tomatoes. I don't know why my slides are skipping. Okay, so the heirloom tomatoes talk, uh, sorry, uh, the contrast is heirloom tomatoes do not look very pretty, but definitely they are more flavorful and therefore they are in demand. Now, 
we understood the meaning in and out my next question to you is do we have any grammatical error in this sentence if you say yes also present that error if you say yes then tell me what that error is the they see this is why i wanted you to understand to jot down the points they is not even in the underlined portion so i don't know uh, no verb for ht appearing should be they appear uh, yes no verb for ht yes that's exactly yes the sentence has no pronoun modifier not in the correct place no all ht has no verb that's the only error that we have in this sentence pay very close attention to the sentence all the subjects are in blue all the subjects are in blue now they has two verbs are and have heirloom tomatoes has its verb are but where is the verb for heirloom tomatoes in the first part of the sentence where is the verb now there is nothing wrong with the usage of although appearing less appetizing there is nothing wrong with this part of the sentence it's absolutely right you can definitely say although appearing less appetizing because essentially appearing is acting as a verb ing modifier here which is uh, modifying the noun heirloom tomatoes and although when we add to it we add that contrast to this aspect of the sentence so no problems with the usage of although appearing less appetizing the real problem with the sentence is that heirloom tomatoes does not have a verb this subject does not have a verb that's the only problem now those of you who are again asking questions about hey what about they don't because they you know they seems to be talking about red and round supermarkets again this is the whole point of going through the entire sentence anal uh, the meaning analysis the supermarket cousins have already been identified as round and red so what are green and striped or have plenty of bumps and bruises this part or this pronoun rather can only talk about heirloom tomatoes it cannot talk about anything else and that's why the author has taken the pain to present it to us that hey if i'm calling the heirloom tomatoes less appetizing there is a reason for it and he describes how heirloom tomatoes look so you should have no doubts in your mind that this day is only and only talking about heirloom tomatoes nothing at all and this is what you told me when i asked you this question at this over here look at aspect 3 right so there is no problem with this part of the sentence they can only logically refer to heirloom tomatoes because supermarket cousins have already been called red and round there is no question of they being called green or striped or bruises and bumps okay all right so definitely the only error in this sentence is that we do not have the verb for the noun heirloom tomatoes and that is what we need to fix and choice b definitely fixes that error most of you uh, landed on the correct answer choice 42% of my class was or is with choice b but i hope now that you understand the meaning of the sentence really well the only problem in i mean there should not be any confusion about what this day is talking about even if there is a pronoun we know for sure that this day is is only and only talking about heirloom tomatoes and nothing else okay so choice b changes the structure of the sentence a little bit although heirloom tomatoes and then definitely this this was our description in the original sentence the correct answer choice retains that and the missing verb has been compensated for although heirloom tomatoes less appetizing than most of their round and red supermarket cousins hey do you want to know how do they look yeah they are often green and striped or have plenty of bumps and bruises so i agree with the author that they look less appetizing but heirlooms are more flavorful and thus in increasing demand 
this is how you need to get yourself involved with the sentence in order to understand the meaning and in order to understand the intent uh, right intended meaning of the sentence okay so uh, you can already see choice c also has the same issue heirloom tomatoes again does not have a verb in choice d we do see the verb for heirloom tomatoes but look at it no contrast anymore the word although is not there the word but is not there the word however is not there all the even though is not there you know whatever contrast presenting expressions that we can think about each of them are missing each of them is missing in the choice d so the contrast has been taken away and we need that contrast in the sentence because that contrast is logical the sentence does want to say that yes heirloom tomatoes look probably ugly i don't want to use that word let's say less attractive but but the fact remains that they are more flavorful and that's why they are in increasing demand so choice d alters the meaning by taking out that contrast and choice c again has the missing verb error okay now let me take a quick pulse of the class do you see the efficacy of spending the time with the original sentence in trying to understand the meaning when we involve so much with our original sentence and just not read it once and just read it to understand the underlying portion of the sentence our understanding of the sentence is far more be far much better and definitely we you know when we understand the meaning it is very easy for us to decide the grammar of the sentence okay so we always start with logic sc always starts with logic first let me understand what my friend the author is trying to say and then i can decide or i can use appropriate grammar to convey that meaning and that's what happened here also the meaning that my friend author wants to convey is absolutely fine yes you're presenting a contrast between heirloom tomatoes and supermarket cousins their supermarket cousins not my supermarket cousin but yes my dear friend you missed out the verb and when i write choice when i write sentence the way choice b is written i fix that grammar for you all right so let's do the takeaway once again we extracted you know all those questions that i asked you who is green and striped who have bump, uh, uh, bumps and bruises who is more flavorful so on and so forth all those questions we asked only to get logically involved with our sentence only to derive all the logical points that my sentence must convey must uh, incorporate to uh, to con uh, convey the intended logical meaning right and even if the original sentence had a missing verb which makes the sentence completely incomplete we did not have any issues in understanding the meaning of that sentence okay so if we involve ourselves like that with the original sentence we can understand the meaning okay another official question that you solved this time 55% of the sentence was underlined splits was not possible because um the structure of the answer choices kept changing but we were able to narrow down to choices b and d because only these two choices had the verbs for heirloom tomato but we knew that choice d although grammatically correct has the verb for my subject i do not want that answer choice because it did not convey the intended contrast and that was so logic was my only point of decision to reject choice d not the grammar it was not grammar it was the meaning that helped me reject choice d because it missed out the contrast and that's why we say 100% meaning understanding is required when you come to a situation uh, when you have to make a decision between two answer choices so for difficult questions 
it is going to be the uh, the logic that's going to guide you through this. Okay. All right. So with this, let's see what we have next. Are we ready for next question? Are we ready for our next question? We have two more questions to go. Show some enthusiasm. Let's see. <laughs> no, you guys are pretty enthused. I can see that already. All righty. So before I show you the next two questions, I just want to set the context here. The first two sentences that we solved, we did not have to really infer the meaning because the sentence very clearly conveyed the intended meaning and the meaning that it con conveyed was absolutely logical. Right? Do you agree with that? Let's take yes or no poll. Oops, sorry. So what I'm saying is that the first two questions presented logical meaning. So meaning wise the sentence was not off. And so what we had to do is we just had to look at the grammar, fix the grammar and we got our correct answer choices, right? But is it, will, will that be case, will that be the case all the time? Uh, do every uh, SC, uh, uh, does every SC sentence present the logical meaning? No, that's not going to happen. All right, that's not going to happen. So next two questions that you are going to see they do not convey logical meaning. So what are we going to do? We are going to deep, we are going to very carefully look into every information in the sentence to derive the logic. Always remember this point. Answer choices do not help you in understand the logic of the sentence. And because it's just a fragment of a sentence and just a fragment of a sentence cannot help you understand the logic of the sentence. In order to understand the logic of the sentence, you must pay attention to each and every piece of information that is present in the original sentence itself. Okay, so if you do that, you will be able to infer the logical intended meaning even if the original sentence does not do so. And you will see that at work with these two questions. So let's quickly click on still solving. Let's do the ritual so that I can show you the next question, which is super, super interesting. 154 participants. Let's get that number up, guys. Yep, more participation. Let's go. Few more. Let's get that number to 80 at least. I'm almost there. Two more. Alrighty. Here comes question number three on your screen. Again, think logically, all right? Think logically.
All right, let's wind this one up. I'm sure you guys had fun solving this question. This is a very nice question. One of my favorites. All right, can we take last five seconds and wind this one up? All right. All right, let's just do that. End the poll. All right. So as I said, it's a very interesting question. And we will see how we go about solving it, of course, meaning-based method. Again, same drill. I have divided my sentence into two parts. The first part of the sentence says, many of them chiseled from solid rock centuries okay we all understand chisel is a tool right uh, chisel and hammer basically sculptors use it to make sculptures and things like that okay so that's the kind of idea that i'm getting with many of them chiseled from solid rock centuries ago so something has been chiseled <coughs> from solid rock hundreds of years ago <coughs> excuse me All right, so I'm <clears throat> expecting to read what is that entity or what are those <clears throat> entities that have been chiseled from solid rock. <clears throat> and then my sentence says, the mountainous regions of northern Ethiopia are dotted with hundreds of monasteries. So basically, my sentence is telling me that it is the mountainous regions of Ethiopia that have been chiseled from solid rock centuries ago. My question to you is, is this meaning logical? Can mountainous regions be chiseled? As I explained to you why that word is there in the sentence, um, you know, it helps us visualize that what, what can we understand when we say that something is chiseled from solid rock? Did anybody sit on a solid rock to chiseled some mountainous regions of Ethiopia? Does that meaning even make sense? Uh, <clears throat> no, that meaning is not at all logical, okay? So these are the few pieces of information that we are getting from this sentence. It's talking about mountainous regions of northern Ethiopia. In this region, we see hundreds of monasteries. And then the sentence is saying that <coughs> mountainous regions are chiseled from solid rock. And when we really engage ourselves with the sentence, we understand that no. Aspect two that we see here does not make any sense because re mountainous regions cannot cannot be chiseled. Nobody can chisel, you know, with a tool, mountainous regions. So the sentence clearly does not present logical meaning. So what are we going to do? Let's figure out what can be chiseled given from what I mean, which entity should it be that is chiseled from the given piece of information in the sentence? We know mountainous regions cannot be chiseled. So what can be chiseled by humans? I mean, of course, when we are talking about chisel and hammer and tools, of course, they can be used by humans. So what entity can be chiseled by humans in this sentence? And all of you are correct. The only logical thing that can be chiseled from solid rock are hundreds of monasteries. Absolutely correct. So what happened here? I want you to pay attention to the whole process here. I get a sentence that does not convey logical meaning, but I have not looked at the answer choices. What I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to Re, I'm, I'm trying to connect the logical dots here. 
um, to understand what should be the logic conveyed by this sentence and then I realized that yes if the sentence is talking about something being chiseled of course it cannot be mountainous region so what is what am I left with I'm only left with hundreds of monasteries and yes that makes sense to uh, it makes sense to say that hundreds of monasteries are chiseled from solid rock all right very good you understand this meaning now I have another question for you over here okay think about it and then reply okay think about it what I'm going to do is that I'm if I if I take away this part of the sentence which is my first part of the sentence all right if I take it away from the beginning of the sentence and I put it after monasteries will my sentence become correct if I lift that modifier from the beginning of the sentence and then I just place it after monasteries will my sentence become correct <clears throat> think about it I'm glad to see that most of you are saying yes because that indeed is the correct thing to do in this sentence why because when my many of them chiseled is placed next to the mountainous regions I have no doubt in understanding that chiseled is talking about mountainous regions and I don't want this meaning because this meaning is not logical so how can I correct this sentence all I need to do is that I need to place this modifier next to hundreds of monasteries the the entity that it should actually be talking about so if I just lift this modifier and place it next to hundreds of monasteries it will now associate with the closest noun which is hundreds of monasteries and then the meaning that it will present me will be the logical meaning so see I have not looked at the <coughs> uh, at the answer choices yet and let me tell you it's not that I have solved this question so many times I'm already familiar with the answer choices and that's why I'm telling you this no the first time when I solved this question from OG advanced this is how I approach this question because I am in the habit of using the meaning based approach I am in the habit of spending this kind of time upfront with the original sentence where I engage logically with my sentence and once I understood the logical meaning of the sentence I could fix the grammar in this in this sentence and by doing so look at this I already know what my correct answer choice should look like at least for this sentence can I do it for every single sentence can I preempt that what my original sentence should look like no not for every sentence but at least with this sentence I knew that okay this this should be or at least the correct answer choice should have this kind of a construction I want many of them chiseled next to hundreds of monasteries that's my point basically here that's the structure that I want to see in the correct answer choice and when I do that you know my sentence will be correct so before I show you the answer choices and before I show you your attempt once away my takeaway remains the same always ask what makes sense if the sentence is logical well and good that is what we did with uh, sentences a uh, uh, questions one and two we did not have to worry too much about inferring the logic over there because the logic was very very clear but in this sentence the logic was not correct the sentence was presenting illogical meaning so what we did is that we took a step back and we first tried to understand we first tried to shuffle the information in the sentence to make sure what makes sense <clears throat> once I have derived this logical uh, framework now I am going to move ahead with my answer choice analysis okay we've done all of this choice B is again wrong because it is still talking about the same thing it is still telling me that the mountainous regions 
are chiseled or were chiseled were chiseled from rocks centuries ago and that's incorrect okay let me broadcast the results not many of you selected choice a and b so i am glad that you are looking at the meaning based approach you have you have at least started to look at the sentence from logical perspective which is very very good so choice b definitely has that uh, meaning error it also has redundancy error why because we cannot say uh, many hundreds of monasteries we definitely cannot say that hundreds already mean numerous so why we need to say numerous hundreds of monasteries that's wrong so choice b has logical error as well as the grammatical error now choice c fixes our logical error see how many of them chiseled is placed next to uh, monastery hundreds of monasteries so my modification has been fixed my aspect to has been fixed here but choice c again is incorrect because of the use of the wrong verb i don't need our dotting because the monasteries are not coming us as i speak or as you attend this session we use continuous tense for an action that is going on at this very moment but that is not what the sentence wants to say the sentence is only presenting us a general information that hey in that mountainous regions there are many monasteries that's all it wants to say okay we have included a few examples for you over here to understand the meaning uh, to understand the difference between the meaning conveyed by a simple uh, a present continuous tense and a simple past tense verb so take a look at that when you uh, download the pdf we will share that with you at the end of the session looking at choice d choice d also fixes my meaning error it is still saying hundreds of monasteries many of which are chiseled from solid rock centuries but choice d is not the correct answer and i'm and i'm so glad to see that majority of you landed on choice e although that margin is very i mean 42 and 48 well in terms of percentage of course 5% difference but yes choice d is not correct because again the grammar is not right can i use simple present tense for an action that took place hundreds of years ago can i do that can i do that no can i say that a uh, titanic drowns in 1912 i cannot say that because 1912 is over that action is over so the action that is over we cannot use simple present tense for that action and that is why use of are chiseled is wrong in this sentence because centuries ago something that has already happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago we cannot use simple present tense for that sentence now why did you land up on choice d those who you did you did not read your answer choice very uh, very closely yes you saw that the uh, you know Uh, the the logic error has been fixed here and then you like many of which is a chisel from solid okay fine let's go with this because now my um logic has been fixed here but you miss this word r that has been very craftily added in this choice to make it incorrect now hold on to all your questions regarding which in choice d and them in choice e i know that question is going to come up lot of you are th thinking about it but hold on to it i have explanation for that okay let's first take a look at the original answer choice okay we again uh, how different verb tenses present different meanings uh, this point is covered in these couple of uh, in fact more than 3 slides basically so take a look at that again when you get the pdf so hold on to your which versus them but let's come to the original answer choice choice uh, sorry the correct answer choice choice e is the correct answer over here and see the structure this is the structure that we predicted while we were doing the error analysis if you compare choice a and you compare choice e the only difference is there the opening modifier has been lifted from its place and has been placed after hundreds of monasteries nothing else 
no verbal no verb verbiage change not a single word has been changed in this modifier only the placement of this modifier and that's why i'd say that you know when we uh, divide the sentence into smaller chunks we are actually dealing with puzzle pieces so my original sentence the way it is arranged it missed out on that logical part of it all i did was that i picked up this piece and i i placed it after monasteries and that gave me my correct picture you see so that is why so choice e definitely is the correct answer many of them chiseled from solid rock we don't have any issue of verb here chiseled is a verb ed modifier because monasteries are chiseled from solid rock it's not that uh, they did the action of chiseling something so chiseled is a verb ed modifier here okay now let's talk about what is going on with many of which and many of them okay now structure wise if we study the structure of choice d and choice e they both use the correct structure okay why because in choice a we have the independent clause which is still hundreds of monasteries and after that we have a dependent clause because the usage of which calls for another clause in here so many of which are chiseled from solid rock centuries in terms of structure this choice is absolutely fine which is correctly talking about hundreds of monasteries the only problem with choice d is the usage of r so your next question will be so if we replace r with were will this version of the sentence become correct yes it will if you if we turn r to were it will become correct now i'm saying all of this for your understanding you really don't need to get in that you know what if questions but just so you understand that there is there is no problem with the structure of choice d many of which is still referring to the preceding noun which is hundreds of monasteries but the problem is with the usage of the present tense verb r if we turn it to were yes this choice will be correct and that's why we don't have were here because choice e is the correct answer we cannot have two correct answer choices at for one question right and definitely there is no problem with many of them chiseled because it's a noun modifier that is placed next to the noun that is meant to modify just like in the original sentence when many of them chiseled was placed right in the beginning of the sentence because of its nearness to the mountainous regions we associated it with this same way in choice e there should not be any confusion that because many of them chiseled is placed right next to hundreds of monasteries it only talks about hundreds of monasteries and nothing else okay so take to yes or no poll and answer this question are you with me on this explanation do you understand all of it what's going on with choice d what's going on with choice e varun you asked a question is many of which is correct yes many of which is absolutely correct uh, which is a noun modifier so many of which which is talking about monasteries over here many of which are chiseled from solid rock so actually which is talking about monasteries many of these hundreds or maybe hundreds of monasteries also yeah many of these monasteries are chiseled from solid rock no issues with the use of many of which it's just uh, the problem with shayan there is no point asking this question if it was most of which because none of the answer choice gives me that so do not expend your energy and time in asking those what if questions that are absolutely irrelevant to your to solving this question right i mean none of the answer choices is using most of which it's only talking about many of which okay the sent the meaning does not change with most of it or many of it but the good point is that we need not even worry about it because none of the answer choices has that word so why are we even even going there right do not get into this pro, uh, uh, this this habit because then you will 
you you will just land up ending a lot of time and energy in questions that are absolutely irrelevant for solving that question okay manoj uh, dc and noun modifiers well this is also a noun modifier many of which are chiseled is also a noun modifier it's just that noun modifiers appear in different structures and our course eg mat we have a full fledged module on modifiers which talks about all different kinds of modifiers it's it's all there okay all right so with this now let's move on to our takeaways and then i'll take you to the very last question of this session let's do not proceed with sentence correction problem unless you have gotten 100% clarity of the meaning presented by the original sentence if the original sentence presents logical meaning well and good you can start scanning the sentence for the grammar and then you can move on to answer choice analysis but if you do if you find that your original sentence is not presenting a uh, logical meaning that's when you look deeper into the sentence try to uh, 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 study various pieces of information uh, deeply in order to figure out that what can make logical sense in the given context of the sentence all right so that's how we proceed but the first thing is that we get a very strong hold on the logic that the sentence must convey okay so an overview this time we solved a question that was 100% uh, underlined there was no possibility of i mean i wouldn't say there was no possibility of splits of course we had that splits where uh, many of them or many of which was placed next to mountainous regions or was placed next to um uh, monasteries even if that was the case but we did not even have to bother so bother ourselves so much with the grammar because from from right on i mean right from the beginning of the analysis we understood that the original sentence is not even presenting logical meaning and when we did a little deep diving into our meaning we figured out what should be the logic that the sentence must convey and on the basis of that logical framework a and b were out c and d were out because of the wrong verb that we used and so choice e indeed was the correct answer okay so we could only do so because we understood the meaning right in the beginning okay all right let's move on to okay i have a little question for you here but this is not a question that you should answer basically it's for little introspection that solutions that you use currently for your se problems you know go to, i'm i'm hoping that or i'm i'm presuming that it is either the uh, official guide itself or gmat club because yeah, there people are very active and we do have solutions to most of the questions over there so yeah probably that would be your source of looking at the solutions but at egmat this is the level of detail that we provide when we create our solutions and every single sentence be it our pre assessment quizzes post assessment quizzes official questions everything every single question is solved by using this meaning based approach so there is no anomaly anywhere when it comes to the process and that's why everything is in sync you know we we don't try to look at the sentence from grammatical perspective we first understand the meaning and then we fix the grammar so our process is absolutely consistent works for each and every single sc problem and our solutions are this detailed to help you understand what's going on in there and inculcate that habit that you should also have this kind of a process in order to understand the meaning of the sentence okay so with this i come to the very last question of my session uh, so yes we will do the rituals let's click on still solving before i show you the question and while you are clicking on still solving and getting ready for this question let me tell you this is the toughest question um in this entire session okay so that's a disclaimer for me 
and you and you'll have to really look into i mean this sentence requires work from your end it requires your involvement logically from uh, 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 in terms of meaning so do that be ready to do that work up front on the original sentence okay um little more participation can i get that number up to 70 i just need eight of eight more of you to click on this let's just do this all righty here comes question number 4 again spend you know use your logical approach to get the right answers from the original sentence before you make a selection all the best
All right. Time to wind this one up. Let's take a few more seconds and then we will get into the analysis of this question. All right, last three seconds, three, two, one, zero. All right, I'm ending the poll. Those who want to make a selection, just click on any answer choice and let's move on. Otherwise, here I close the poll. All right, just one person left to select an answer choice. Okay, there we go, 100%. Now, before I start the analysis of this question, I want to ask a question. How many of you are 100% confident of your selection today on this question? You are 100% sure this indeed is the right answer and I have selected it for the right reason. How many of you can say that, that what the selection that I have made is correct and I'm 100% sure this is the reason for this answer choice. Good to see that most of you are very, very confident about your selection. And while we analyze this sentence, let's see, uh, you know, how many of you, I mean, you might have landed on the correct answer choice. This is another tricky part of this question that most of the people do land up on the correct answer choice. But the thing is to understand is how well did you understand the meaning of the sentence and whether you selected the correct answer choice for the correct reason or not. Let's do the deep diving here. Okay. Youth sentence. I definitely cannot read it in one go. So I'm going to break it down as you see it on my screen. About 5 million acres in the United States have been invaded by leafy spurge. Okay. So if I you know, translate this whole sentence in my own words, I'm going to say that a huge land area in the United States have been covered by something called leafy spurge. And even if I don't know what exactly leafy spurge is, I do understand that it has to be a kind of vegetation because land area can be covered by vegetation and then I have leafy whatever. So yeah, looks like that. Let's read on. Well, the author has been kind enough to present the description what leafy spurge is. Leafy spurge is a herbaceous plant. I don't know the meaning of herbaceous, but I'm not going to bother about it because what is important for me to know is that, yes, it is a vegetation. It's a kind of plant. Where does it come from? It comes from Eurasia. Next piece of information. Leafy spurge contain milky sap. What does milky sap do? it gives mouth sores to cattle. So far, so good. This Till this part, the sentence flows absolutely correct, absolutely well. The meaning is absolutely fine. Now, the last, the last part of the sentence with these two modifiers that I'm dealing with, what do we have here? It's a comma plus verb ing modifier. And if you went through the free uh, free resources that we recommend all the students to go through before you come for this session. You must have read about comma plus verb by ng modifiers and these are action modifiers. Okay. So what action are they modifying? Let's first understand this. The way the sentence is written, it is saying that milky sap gives mouth sores to cattle. Okay. We understand that part. And because it does so, it displaces grasses and other cattle food. So do you think that this cause and effect is even logical that because milky sap gives mouth source to cattle, in doing so as a result, it displaces grasses and other cattle food? Is this meaning logical? Think about it and tell me, is this cause and effect even logical? Most definitely not because milky sap cannot displace grasses and, and other cattle food no matter what it does. Replacing grass and cattle food 
a vegetation can replace or displace another vegetation right or something else but milky sap because they are found in leafy spurge right so we cannot say that milky sap displaces grasses and other cattle food that meaning is absolutely absolutely illogical okay so if the sentence is illogical then what do you think displaces grasses and other cattle food what other entity in the sentence can logically make sense in saying that it displaces grasses and other cattle food absolutely correct it is either you call it ls you call it leafy spurs you call it herbaceous plant whatever it is you know it is only leafy spurs that can displace grasses and other cattle food so this action we must connect it logically with a herbaceous plant or with leafy spurs it's the same thing leafy spurs is equal to herbaceous plant so even if we say that i need to connect this action with herbaceous plant i am right because i'm actually connecting it with leafy spurs okay that's the first part of my question now let's deal with rendering rangeland worthless okay rendering rangeland worthless means that the grazing grounds become useless right so what is the cause and effect that i'm getting from the way the sentence is written it's saying that because milky sap gives mouth source to cattle it also makes the grazing grounds useless now is it correct cause and effect is it logical can we say that it is logical to say that because milky sap gives mouth sore to cattle it ends up making the grazing ground useless is it is it milky sap that making that is making that uh, that is making the um, grazing grounds useless no most definitely not that cause and effect just does not make any sense okay doesn't make any sense so here again we will ask this question from the sentence that what makes grazing ground worthless think about it ah i see that answer over there that's the the most precise answer it is the displacement come to think about it leafy spurge displaces grasses and other cattle food and the result of this displacement is that the grazing grounds become useless why again we are inferring this meaning why because the cattle get mouth sores from eating leafy spurge so they are not going to go to those grazing grounds where there is no grasses where there is no cattle food instead there are leafy spurge so if grasses have been displaced or cattle food has been displaced by leafy spurge uh, the cattle will not go to those grazing grounds to eat because eating leafy spurge gives them mouth sores nobody wants to be in pain and so what will happen is that those rangeland or those grazing grounds will become useless all right so again so this action should actually be presented as the result of this action which is displacement so before i move on with any further analysis i just want to understand from you are you all with me in this logical analysis of the usage of the action of displacing and rendering is it absolutely clear to you now can you go and teach this sentence to anybody <laughs> i'm sure you can all right so yes now we understand see this is the beauty of engaging with the sentence only in terms of logic when we understand that okay these two modifiers are giving me this meaning but i know for sure that that meaning does not make sense i do not stop there i i take it a step further and i ask myself what will make sense in this context 
I know displacement is done by leafy spurge. So that this action of displacement has to be somehow connected with leafy spurge. Here, I am not able to predict my original answer choice, but I know for sure that I want to see the action of displacement connected with leafy spurge or herbaceous plant. And then rendering rangeland worthless should actually be presenting the outcome of this displacement because the displacement leads to the uselessness of the grazing grounds. Okay. So with this level of understanding and with this, all of this that I have, let me clearly clear the screen so that you can see things clearly over here. Okay. So with this understanding, now let's move on to our answer choices. And indeed, Choice B is the correct answer and well done. 46% of the class landed up on choice B. Okay. Uh, now let's see whether we did that for the right reason or not. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is that I request all of you not to pose any questions at this moment. That's why I've taken away the short answer poll also. Pay attention to the analysis. Okay. That's when you will understand that why choice B is the correct answer for those of you who did, who did not choose choice B. The sentence says 5 million acres in the United States have been invaded by leafy spurge. I agree to that. Herbaceous plant from Eurasia, yes. This was there in, in the original sentence also with milky sap. Yes, herbaceous plant contains milky sap. Now let's take a look at this that. What this that is talking about, that gives mouth sores to cattle and displaces. So it means that both these verbs are connecting to that. So that must be talking about leafy spurge because only leafy spurge displaces grasses and other cattle food. Now you will say, hey, are you... Uh, just a second. Are you saying that we are changing the meaning through choice uh, B? No, we are not changing the meaning. Yes, I know that choice A said that milky, milky uh, sap gives mouth sores, but choice B is saying that leafy spurge is giving mouth sore. First, uh, take to yes or no poll and tell me, do you think that there is really the change in meaning? Is there really a change in meaning? Come to think about it. Are milky, milky sap and leafy spurge mutually exclusive elements? Is it so that milky sap appears or exists outside of leafy spurge? Absolutely correct. Milky sap comes from leafy spurge. So if the cattle, the cattle has to chew leafy spurge in order to get that milky sap to cause the mouth sore. Okay. To cause the mouth sore. So it does not matter. We say that milky sap gives mouth sore or leafy spurge gives mouth sore because milky sap is coming from mouth sores. Uh, sorry, from uh, leafy spurge. So it does not, It there is no meaning change at all. Now how that is going to modify leafy spurge and not milky sap? Well, this modifier with milky sap is actually placed between two commas. So here it is a little grammatical nuance. With milky sap is uh, enclosed between two commas and that's what gives the liberty to our noun modifier that to jump over this part of the sentence and directly connect with a herbaceous plant which is talking about leafy spurge. And we have, all, I mean, this is called a noun modifier modifying a slightly far away noun. We have um, 
the article on GMAT Club at the end of this session. You will get the link to that article if you want to go read that. That's one of the most loved articles on GMAT Club by eGMAT. So go read it. Uh, it has very good information about how sometimes the touch rule, with, uh, the famous touch rule does not work with, they apparently seem to not work. But yeah, um, there is a little nuance to that. And here, this is what we see, that that is actually talking about herbaceous plants. It's not talking about milky sap at all. So that gives mouth source to cattle. Leafy spurge gives mouth source to cattle. Leafy spurge displaces grasses and other cattle food. And see how this last part of the sentence is correctly presenting the result of the action of displacement. So choice B is indeed the correct answer over here okay because logically everything is put in place through choice b okay so this is what i was talking about noun modifiers can modify far away noun um, these are the conditions but again if you go into if you look into the uh, the article you will have much more explanation to this. There are a lot of official questions that apply this structure. So it's not that, you know, there will be no application of this, um, of this nuance. There is one of the questions we just solved, leafy spurge, okay? So here we have some examples. Also, we have two official questions in which um, this, uh, this, structure has been employed let me go back i mean my yeah it's skipping okay yeah so these are the two official questions that use the same structure of far away noun modification and stacy who i miss here today uh, she's created wonderful videos on these two questions the link to which will be shared with you at the end of the session so do take a look uh, for your for, for your understanding of how noun modifiers can skip a few elements behind them to connect with the entity that they should logically connect with okay all right now let's move on let's so choice b we did all of that analysis every meaning is fine let's take a structure of choice c uh, five million acres have been invaded by leafy spurge whatever whatever here what we see is that having milky sap and displacing grasses have been put on the same level as part of a list but this list is not parallel because having milky sap is a feature or a characteristic of leafy spurge and displacing grasses is an action done by leafy spurge and these two entities are not grammatically at the same level and that's why choice c is wrong also we know now we don't know uh, i mean we know that there is a problem with the usage of comma plus verb ing modifier because we don't know what action it is modifying now so aspect 3 continues to remain incorrect with the usage of comma plus rendering because now we don't even know what is it talking about also we do have problem with the apparent parallelism in choice C. Let's take a look at choice D. Very interesting answer choice. How pretty it looks with this kind of modifier. But the meaning is totally out here. This choice is saying that is now talking about milky sap. Because see, with milky sap is not enclosed between two commas. <clears throat> so here that is actually connected with milky sap so the sentence is saying that milky sap gives mouth sores yes that makes sense milky sap displaces grasses and other cattle food most definitely not milky sap renders range length worthless most definitely not <clears throat> so that's my logical issue with subject verb making sense with their i mean the subject making sense with their verbs also the cause and effect has been taken away see comma plus rendering that was presenting the effect of the action of displacing grasses is now gone. So that's another meaning error that we have here. And the most blatant error in this choice is that 5 million acres has no verb. 
So grammatically and logically on both perspectives, choice D is incorrect. Choice E repeats that missing verb error for my subject 5 million acres. And once again, you know, it does not make sense to say that it is the milky sap that displaces grasses and other cattle food. So that's definitely an error. And once again, my rendering rangeland worthless, I don't know what this comma plus verb ing modifier is associating with. So for these reasons, we rejected choices A, C, D and E and choice B indeed is my correct answer choice. All right. So uh, let's let's uh, move on to the observations. Again, this was a very context heavy sentence very very context heavy sentence okay lot of things happening lot of layers of information first thing we did is that we broke the sentence down into smaller chunks without that there was no way we could have understood or we could connect the logical dots so it is imperative that you do not read the entire sentence in one go you read them chunk after chunk so that you can connect those logical dots to understand the meaning conveyed by the sentence and then you take your decision whether this meaning is logical or not. If it is logical, we move on to our next step. If it is not logical, that's when we again look at these different entities and try to figure out what will be the logic in the context of that sentence. All right. Again, uh, example of an answer of an official question where we could not really use uh, splits because structures kept changing with every answer choice. Again, choice A, grammatically correct. There was no grammar issue with that answer choice. That answer choice is solely uh, uh, incorrect because of the meaning error. And once we put the meaning together, we put all the logical aspects into place, we knew it is choice B that I want. No other answer choice works in there. All right. So with this, my part is over. I had a great time doing these questions with you. I hope you got a good hang of the meaning based approach, how it is so very important to first understand the logic because that's the whole idea of any sort of communication, be it verbal or written. We need to present the logical meaning and then we choose our grammar as a tool to express that idea. So keep that point in mind. Always look at SC from the meaning perspective and use grammar to frame that logic. With this, I'll take your leave and I invite back Rajat in this session for the concluding part. Thank you all of you. Rajat, over to you. Thank you, Shraddha. Let me first of all check if I have the right microphone. I do. Um, and with that, I want to actually just hide this. I'm going to share my own presentation. And while I do that, you know, let's get some uh, feedback on the session from you guys. Um, uh, let's make sure we, yeah, let's make sure we get some feedback on the session. So I'm going to put in the short answer part over here. I'm going to clear all answers and uh, tell me what is it that were that you guys took away from the session so far. So if you can type your answers in, meanwhile, I upload. Very informative, okay. Let's get a few more comments. So overall, what did you learn from the session? All right, meaning is key, oh, logic first, okay. Splits pattern recognition subject verb. Should you always understand the logic and infer the meaning of the question? Um, yes, you should. 
that is the meaning based approach okay this was my first gmat session and how i got an insight on how classes go this is frankly a, I, I i would say just a just a, an introduction session or so okay um to to this so um so that's that's good to know that that this was good splits method doesn't work a lot of splits method is actually not a method that's designed for sc it's a method that people uh, use to sell you tricks which by the way seem very easy to sell uh, but but really are not so easy to execute or or don't work on the real test okay um with that you know there's a what i call as a follow up session to this we have a shraddha is actually hosting a follow up session which is on on wednesday and uh, you guys can join that follow up session which is on verb ing modifiers and 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 this session um you can if you click on link number 5 over here um then then that's that will take you to that session if you register on that uh, we are hosting the session on on gmat club's youtube channel that is something that uh, you know you'd be able to do that and we'll we'll host a few more follow up sessions as well so that's something that i want to make sure that you do okay what is the next thing that you will do post the session just to make sure you get the most out of the session other than registering for the session again number 5 over here uh, on the top but what is the next thing that you got to do to make sure you get the most out of the session are we both going to marry well uh, i think to that both of us are mar uh, married to different people so that's actually married to my my one of my best friends um and and pail who's my wife she is uh, i think i would call it shraddha's mentor in many ways um uh, okay good question practice ogsc questions don't do that you're not ready for that don't practice just go blindly practicing more questions the first thing is do the free lessons on verb bd and verb ing modifiers um and, uh, and 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 make sure you, you you do the very focused questions that you have with those that's very important why because you've learned this approach you want to cement this approach you want to build that foundation and 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 this gives you that foundation also so so make sure you do that um so with that let's kind of also if you want to know more about how people succeed on the gmat uh, you know uh, uh, sign up on our on our youtube channel as well we actually post two success stories um, every week um, or so for the last i'd say Six to eight weeks, we've been posting the success stories of people who've scored better than ninety-nine percentile on GMAT Verbal, um, and and so I think this is this will tell you what two people who actually do well on both Verbal and Quant do. The EGMAT YouTube channel is the world's largest repository of um, of success stories. So you have um, GMAT success stories as you can see over here. This one uh, we're kind of hitting that two hundred number or so, and and this is. For me, uh, I'm very proud of this why because there is no other GMAT channel or, or MBN GMAT channel that even has 50 success stories. Um, also, we have stuff around um, MBA admits. We have about 45 journeys um, overall in there. This is where people talk about how did they get into top B schools, how did they portray leadership, what was the role played by the by the GMAT score or so. And and so even though we talk about forty five journeys or rather forty five videos, there are about um, there are some videos that have four or five journeys in there where we have people in a panel, and and so overall you'll see about sixty people talking about how how did they get scholarships, admits, and and and, and how do they take on rejections? I mean because they are a part of it, um, and which is where you have case studies from scholarships as well. So Sharan, for example, this is about seven million dollars worth of case studies um, that that you can get to um an example of this is sharang who who actually had eight who faced eight rejections and then he got five admits so upwards of quarter of a million dollars worth of scholarship um and then uh, uh, we we also have uh, 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 a few folks who actually had 15 rejects and then got five full rides or so and then you know you'd get to see the latest and greatest from from eg mat we will talk about uh, what's the new technology that we we're building how does that help you get to to success faster or so okay um again uh you can the youtube success stories the links are on top over here for those of you who want to get the session presentation let me give you the session pdf as well so um and i showed the i know sure that you put it on um on on the other part i just want to go through this over here 
How do you clock answers faster? Use this approach. Why? Because that's, there's no other way to get there. So with that, I want to talk about how do you build ability. And, 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 um, and the reason for this is because this is, uh, a lot of people talk about tricks, as you guys have been talking about over here and you've heard about it, that don't, the, using tricks, that doesn't lead to success. Okay. Um, using the meaning-based approach actually helps you succeed. And, and I'm going to talk about two ways, uh, two of the thousands of case studies you're going to see um, either on our, in our review section on GMAT Club or on our YouTube channel. There's a guy who, very, very smart guy. His name is Dr. Rohit Singh Malan. He is a, a doctor by profession. Then he actually became an IDES officer and then decided to take the GMAT. And, and um, so super smart guy, very well-spoken guy or so. But when he took the GMAT, for the first time, he was able to get to a V32 only. Why? Because he didn't follow the meaning-based approach. He followed the split-based approach. And when he did that, as he got to difficult questions, he just couldn't figure out which of the answer choices make sense because all of them, from a grammar standpoint, made sense. And, and for him, the issue really was, hey, all of these constructions or structures sound right. How do I figure out which is the correct one? Then he joined EGMAT. He actually started with the meaning-based approach. And, and that allowed him to figure out what is it that the author wanted to... Uh, intended to communicate and and as he could see that he could figure out hey even though there are structures that sound right from a grammatical standpoint they're they're beautifully constructed but from the the author's intent standpoint they didn't communicate the right meaning as a result um you know when he did that he was able to choose answers more confidently and was able to get to a 96th percentile on gmat verbal he actually saved time as well why because when you're not confused you get to answers faster so another student, um, uh, so Rohit went, um, uh, got an admit from, from um, Kellogg. Jim received secured admits from Columbia as well as Booth. He's currently studying at Booth. Uh, for him, he said the meaningless approach is a game changer. Before that, he was just learning grammar. So this guy is, is a Chinese-Canadian, so he's practically a native speaker. And, and, and he discovered the same thing. He, he got a V34 in his first attempt, and, um, and, and for him, the issue was meaning. And, um, and, and again... Um, he struggled with 700 level questions and, and once he started using the meaning based approach within 20 days, okay, he was able to improve from a, from a 700 to a 770 and the delta was meaning from a 65th percentile in sentence correction to a 94th percentile overall. Okay. And, and, and again, this is all thanks to Pyle who invented that meaning based approach in, in 2010. And, and, and if you look at, you know, go to uh, beat the GMAT and GMAT club, you look at EG Maths responses on, on, on any one of these forums, you'll see the meaning-based approach right there. If you look at and look at any of the other set of responses, you'd see the meaning-based approach start come, comes in post-2016 or so. Um, and, and the reason for that is for the first six years, we were ridiculed for this approach. And, and as people saw the, the uh, success that this approach delivered, they started adopting this approach or so. And, and even... Now we continue to refine this approach. What you saw in this session is a third generation of, um, of, of that approach. Um, if you look at our responses in 2010, they used the meaning-based approach. Uh, they weren't as systematic as what they are today. And, and, and as we continue to refine these, um, the success continues to grow up, which is why if you look at just 2021 and you look at the number of 700 scores reported on GMAT Club, that's not the ones that we delivered. We delivered probably six, six as many. Um, but reported on, on, on GMAT Club, you can really see uh, this is the data between January 1st to July 31st or so. And we've reported more scores than um, uh, than uh, than any other uh, uh, a partner, or in fact, all the other partners combined. In fact, if you look at the last two months or so, which is August and September, um, you know, again, this the, the delta is even more stark. We've actually reported twice as many 700 scores as pretty much all of these guys combined. Okay. And this is because as a company, we continue to invest in, in, in helping you succeed. We've um, just in 2021, we've launched our new iteration of Scholarium. We've doubled down on our investments in AI, which, which help you improve faster. We've re revamped our entire quant offering. In fact, one of the things that I mean, you guys probably know is for, for, verbal but what you don't know is in 2021 we've also delivered twice as many q49 plus scores um, as as any other prep company combined in fact when you compare us to target test prep we've delivered 3x as many q49 scores all of that is thanks to quant2.0 and 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 
with the technology we, we actually now allow you to build your own learning paths within the course and that's true within the quant course in the verbal course in another three months or so and then we have a special program where if you are in that 660 to 700 zone we push you towards that uh, we have this program which is designed for those people that helps you get to that 730 to 770 zone or so okay um so so yeah so with that let's kind of talk about how do you get to that 90th percentile and then within EGMAT we follow a very simplified approach to to getting to that 90th percentile where we first make sure you have the right foundation which is called what we call a stage one of learning where we teach you all the concepts and application um this is where most people when they do things right they spend about 70 percent of their time and 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 if they do this right they hit that 90th percentile uh, uh in in the remaining 30 percent also this allows people to to a sentence correction or any other subsection in about 40 percent less time than you'd use um, any other method to get there okay um so how do these stages lead to improvement in ability when you go through stage one you get to about up to 55th percentile ability if you do stage one well um, if you do stage two well, you can go from 56 to about 80th percentile, depending on how well you do it. And if you, um, uh, so between 17th and 80th percentile, that is. So that's the jump that you make. And, and then as you get to stage three, you make that jump from the 71st to that 90th percentile or so. Okay. Um, guys, if you have questions, you can ask them in the Q&A pod. Should you take the, take the course if you have, if you need to take the GMAT in the next 25 days? If you feel you need to take a course, then you probably should not be taking the GMAT in the next 25 days. Or if you're just right next to uh, ex the exception that if you're right within 20, 30 points of, of your target GMAT score or so. Okay. So with that, let's kind of talk about stage one overall in this case. And um, and, and, and so um, um, a lot of people and, and, and where we are different in this case is that uh, uh, a lot of people think about GMAT SC as, as uh, and study about G, study GMAT's intense correction with the, with the mindset that they're gonna study all the concepts, then do a, a bunch of practice, and, 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 and they think that that's how they're gonna ace GMAT's intense correction. Am I correct? Just some feedback. Um, that's how you guys really say, I'm gonna study all the concepts, you know, spend five, six days studying all the concepts, and I'm gonna do a bunch of practice, and then as I do practice, I make mistakes, and, and I'm gonna do well. On, on, on SC, eventually I'll get to that 90th percentile or so. At EGMAT, we actually take it very differently. And I'm gonna tell you the, the, the difference in the mindset of a 90th percentile student and, and, and that of a 60th, someone who actually spends time and but only gets to that 60th percentile or so. Okay. So at, at GMAT SC, at EGMAT, we kind of consider GMAT SC to be composed of 200 SC concepts or what we call as 200 different sentence structures. And you've got some sort of an idea of what these sentence structures are just in this session. Why? Because, you know, even though you saw just four examples, you were exposed to about 20 to 25 sentence structures. And you saw that different sentence structures lead to different error types. That also leads to different uh, interpretations or different meanings. And mastering these sentence structures is... Uh, 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 is, is really essential when it comes to getting to that 90th percentile. And, and what do you need to do to make sure that you've mastered these 200 sentence structures is you need evidence, you need feedback to tell you that you've done this well and you've not done this well. Okay. Uh, and what is, and some people will say, what are these sentence structures? You know, they start with the very basics where you look at verb ED form, forms and you really say, hey, in what scenarios, um, are they used as verbs? In what scenarios are they modifiers? And am I proficient at identifying them? Um, in what ways or in what scenarios can noun modifiers modify not just the, the noun right next to them, but far nouns that are far away from them? Um, can I identify scenarios in which the verb ing modifier acts as an action modifier versus a noun modifier or so? And as you get to more sophistication, you, are, you know, there are certain sentence structures that can be used interchangeably. Uh, can I identify where verb ing modifiers and non plus non modifiers can be used to communicate the same meaning and they're both correct. Why? Because sometimes in the original question you might see a verb ing form where there's a grammatical error 
but then the meaning is 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 that it communicates is is the is the correct intended is a logical intended meaning and then the correct answer communicates the same meaning using a noun plus noun modifier and if you, you need to be proficient in identifying that um uh, sometimes the the author would change the voice and and and, and where uh, it leads to modifier errors which in turn leads to meaning errors you need to be proficient in identifying such cases or so and and overall modifier errors of course lead to meaning errors and this is just an example a, a minor set of examples of things that you should have evidence that you can do this where where hey by changing the placement of the modifier by putting it ahead of the sentence versus in the middle of the sentence how it leads to meaning errors again grammatically perfectly constructed sentences but but meaning wise not and 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 the ability to to be able to master these sentence structures is is what leads to to you get into that 90th percentile so in many ways it is about achieving perfection or so and so when we think about a 60th versus a 90th percentile student you know that they they get to those those different endpoints because they have different attitude a 60th percentile student considers gmat sc to be about these these major error types and and then says if i know these error types i'm going to use splits i'm going to focus on the error types that are there in splits and and i'm going to figure out which makes which option makes sense and and when they do this this they spend about 30% of their time learning and and they do about 8 to 10 quizzes while learning which is where each quiz is a feedback point and then they spend 70% of their time practicing and then they practice hundreds and hundreds of questions and and get end up with that 60th percentile score a 90th percentile student actually goes a lot more slowly he or she thinks about GMAT SC as as these 200 sentence structures, which you know have these error types in there, but it's primarily about sentence structure, and because it's primarily about sentence structure, you you end up using meaning as the the the, the core method. He or she doesn't look at splits. He or she says, "What is it that the author intends to communicate?" and and then let's look at the most effective way of communicating that that meaning. That student looks at a lot more feedback points. Why? because that feedback tells him or her which sentence structures come naturally to 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 them and which ones actually need more reinforcement need more revision or so and for them as i said stage 1 is where they spend a majority of their time because they do master stage 1 well they don't need as much time or, or they don't need as much practice in stage 2 okay um so with that let's kind of get there and and uh, let's talk about application a lot of people who are in that 60th percentile bracket or or in that first kind of student they they focus on learning application while they practice questions which is you know once you've learned the concepts that's when they say hey that's when i'm going to learn how to apply it, by practicing at egmat we teach you application 23 times while you are in stage 1 and give you feedback on how well you are applying those concepts and for us that integrated approach is very important for example when you do subject verb in stage in in stage 1 you learn application twice when you do modifiers you learn application five times it's not just about learning application you practice that application another five to six times as well where where every entity of practice has about five to seven questions so you're talking about 30 solving 30 35 questions in the learning phase not the practice phase um so that you know you've attained mastery and which is why that learning phase is is is, is about 60% of your prep time it's it builds that solid foundation when you have that foundation then moving up to to those difficult questions achieving that 90th percentile is fairly simple or so okay um how do we give feedback let's just talk about this over here this is the simplest module that you will see in the egmat sc course it's a subject verb module the smallest module what you see over here first of all is that just in subject verb you see how comprehensive this is if you sum this up you 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 you're looking at about a uh, uh, a good 7 hours of learning 6 to 7 hours of learning just in subject verb okay and 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 the reason why this is there is because it's not just about learning hey uh, singular subjects should have singular verbs and plural subjects should have plural verbs but learning this in the context of all of those sentence structures it's laying that foundation of sentence structures now each activity over here is evaluated when you see this 100% it's not the completion time it's your evaluation it's like what proficiency have you attained um in 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 subject verb agree number 
this time is not the length of the video it's how much time you spent we build technology to track this always singular subjects again there is there are two separate evaluations built into this file to ensure that when you go through the lesson you're able to apply the the conceptual part of it when you do all of this there's a practice quiz with all of these concepts together just the subject work together so that we can really see that hey you've not forgotten a green number well, when you did word set change number or so then you get application then you practice that application and then you get a set of official questions if you want to practice and these are very targeted chosen questions or so okay um, now in this case this guy scored low over here but look at the amount of time he spent he clearly spent time revising this which is why he was able to get a hundred percent in the in the following practice case so there's this reinforcement there right away this is the verbs module very very similar journey he didn't do as well over here and and then he did very well over here we're going to really see why and how he improved on the mistakes in this case but by the way look at the amount of time this guy is spending on 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 verb sequencing and verbs application again very very intense modules you require focus to and you require that these evaluations don't come easy but if there are gaps you will see them right here right here so how did this guy improve in in the, in the verbs quiz in this file over here this one at the bottom because he revises mistakes in the preceding file we know this because these are this is the quiz results screen and you can see these questions are flagged for revision and these are the ones that he got wrong so we track all of those things we give you feedback so that you can take that feedback right then and there and improve right away okay and again for him it was the application that made a difference why because his concepts he took the gmat twice prior to joining each gmat and his concepts were there but he wasn't following the meaning based approach he wasn't applying the meaning based approach which is why he, he faltered so many times or so okay so just within the sc course how much feedback do we give it's about 150 points of feedback and you can really see at how this feedback is distributed across various stages this is stage one of learning where you see the concept level and application level feedback this is stage two and 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 this is stage three and by the way once you are done with stage one and stage two stage three is just that's when it's 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 focused practice okay all right with that uh, i think that's all that i had for you guys um as a next step watch the lessons in the free trial and um, and 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 attend the and then attend the uh, the next set of sessions uh, with that, let me just go into our, 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 our last mode. Here you can download a bunch of things overall. Um, how does it long, how, how long does it take to complete all stages? Well, and that's a great question. The answer to that is depends on what your starting ability is. For example, if you're someone who starts with a starting ability of, um, of 50th percentile in SC, um, you know, you would probably take about 31 to 32 hours to finish the SC course. Why? Because the reason why you have 50 uh, 50th percentile ability in SC means that you already know some of the basic concepts and as you go through those basic concepts they have a pre-assessment quiz that will tell you hey you know this you don't need to attempt that on the other hand if you were to start if you were to start at the 15th percentile 1-5 you'd probably take about 45 to 50 hours to go through the SC course um, and so on and so forth now and that's one of the reasons why I ask people to go through uh, to subscribe to our YouTube channel because we have all of these journeys and and as you see these journeys, what you're going to find is there are people who, um, who, who, who actually don't go through portions of our course because their initial starting ability is just high. So, so if someone, for example, starts at an 80th percentile in CR, we just fast track that person to stage three in, in CR so that they can go from that 80th percentile to that 90th percentile or so. So how does it take to complete all stages depends on your starting ability and and you know the range of answers depends on you know the, the time to, f to get to your target score i wouldn't like to say the time to finish the course but the time to get to your target score could vary from 60 hours to 350 hours you know if you're st someone who's starting at a 400 and want to get to a 720 you're looking at about a 300 to 330 hour kind of commitment um, if you're someone who's starting at a 650 and, and you're looking to get to a 730, 740, you're looking at about 100 hours of commitment. And yes, we personalize your courses. 
Okay, and thank you for those of you who've been giving feedback. Um, just what's there on top, um, you know, um, you have our, 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 uh, uh, our the session presentation in the top left-hand corner. Um, we used, then you have a bunch of helpful links. You have a link to a Sigma X mock that you can take to for your starting abilities, link to RC webinar, which is, which is next Saturday, number of properties webinar that is tomorrow, and to my LinkedIn profile, we, I actually share about five to six um, articles on GMAT and MBA on my profile. So if you want to connect to me over there, that'll be very useful. Then you have some helpful links on our YouTube channel, if you if that's kind of something that's useful for you. Um, and, and some of the success rules that you've talked about over here, um, you know, that you can use as motivation. Yep. And then you also have some links to some official questions that would be very useful post this session. And, and these are links to, I think, the corresponding YouTube solutions or so. Okay, Guna says, how many hours does someone need to invest considering recollecting the basic concepts? All of this is included in the study plan. You know, you don't go anywhere else to, to recollect any basic concepts. Just to, to set some context, guys, EGMAT quant and verbal courses are way more comprehensive than the, the most comprehensive books that you would have seen or heard about. So, so um, just how easy it is for us to write a book, it, probably is one fifth to one sixth the effort uh, that it takes to build a course. So so uh, all of that's included in there, Guna. Um, when is the session tomorrow? The session tomorrow again is at 7 m Pacific. It's on number properties um, and 7.30 p.m. IST. I think it leads to about 4 p.m. Um, German time. Okay. Um, all right, guys. Uh, with that, I want to thank everyone for joining me today. And uh, if you have questions, you can write to me at roger.e-gmat.com. With that, I want to thank you and wish you good luck. Have a wonderful day.